Many of you asked me about my trip recently. I was in the Scandinavian countries. This was my second trip there. So as you know, I like to observe different Muslim communities and I think it is important for every community to learn about others, to benefit, to understand the trajectories. Because what I find is that the cultures, the societies, the politics actually influences the problems of the Muslims in their own regions. And every single country has its strengths and weaknesses and every Muslim minority has its potential and also its threats. And I think it is very beneficial for every Western community in particular to look at what is happening in other countries and to benefit from what they can and to learn from the experiences. So I will summarize, it's just an introduction, I will summarize my own observations of uh, Islam in Scandinavian uh, countries. Now firstly, what are the Scandinavian countries? The Scandinavian countries are Denmark, Norway and Sweden. And these are, generally speaking, uh, one block of culture, one civilization. Obviously, within them, they have differences. But in reality, compared to the other worlds and, and, and civilizations, this is basically, you can call it the Norse culture, the Nordic culture, the Vikings. This is that trajectory. And of course, as you're aware, Europe has many subdivisions. And the Vikings were a completely separate history and religion than the bulk of Europe. By the way, before I get to modern Norway, Vikings and Islam, there's a, another topic one day, inshallah, we'll talk about that. Actually, uh, just, let me just introduce the concept. Vikings, out of all of the Europeans, they actually had quite a lot of interactions with, with the Muslim world. And they interacted, we find to this day, every few years, we uncover a new treasure in those lands of Arab and Muslim coins which indicates they were interacting with civilizations and Muslims. You probably saw, was it three years ago, BBC had a, a massive uh, uh, article about a Nor Nordic princess 1,200 years ago uncovered with a ring with the name of Allah on it. This is in, Nor in, in, in Sweden. You will find the original still in the Stockholm Museum, you will find it, that you will find the ring. She's, she's a princess. And she's wearing a ring that has the name of Allah on it. This led to a lot of speculation. Is, was there Islam in Sweden? Fact of the matter is no, but listen to this. Arab civilization, Muslim civilization was looked up to. It was the pinnacle. And so the princesses would wear the jewelry purchased from Arab lands. And so we have that type of interaction. We also have... Uh, the, the Vikings would also obviously raid Muslim lands. This is also the case. And there was warfare, minor warfare as well. There's also a very interesting story. Maybe one day I'll talk about it. A group of Vikings uh, got uh, uh, cut off from the main group and they remained in Andalusia in Muslim Spain and they embraced Islam and they lived in Seville in Ishbilia. And so there's an area of Ishbilia still to this day known. This is the area of the Vikings who converted to Islam. So you have a whole bunch of Vikings who became Muslim and they lived in Muslim Spain. This is again a thousand something years ago. In any case, that's another trajectory. Let's go down to modern uh, Scandinavia. The Scandinavian countries, oh, before I move on, I must mention one other historical fact. Many of the youth know it. The Abbasid Khalifa sent a sheikh, an alim, a historian, and an ambassador to travel through these lands. His name is Ahmed ibn Fadlan. This is 1,200 years ago, 1,100 years ago. And why did he send a sheikh? Because a group amongst them, uh, amongst that region, they're, they're, they're known as the Vulgars, they converted to Islam. So they petitioned the Khalifa, can you send us a sheikh to teach us Islam? This is beyond the Viking lands, not in Viking lands. So an ambassador, a sheikh, an alim, a hafil, traveled through Viking lands to get to this, what is now Bulgaria, Vulgar, uh, and, and this still to this day, that community is there of Muslims. Uh, that's a separate uh, ethnicity, not the, the, not the Vikings. But he lived amongst the Vikings. He lived amongst them and he chronicled what he saw. So he becomes one of the earliest eyewitness accounts of life, customs, culture, language of the Vikings. And he then wrote about this, and it is preserved in Arabic documents. Of course, it has been translated into English. M many books have been written. You can find them on, on um, Amazon, Ahmed ibn Fadlan. And in fact, believe it or not, uh, Hollywood actually made a movie about this person um, back in the 90s. I think it's called what the tribe 13th, tribe 13th, or something, the 13th warrior. So they actually made a positive movie. You know, usually Hollywood has nothing but negative. This guy, Ahmed ibn Fadlan, they made a whole movie about him, 
long time ago, 20, 25 years ago, and it's actually a very positive movie portraying how Islam was a superior culture compared to Europe and compared to the Vikings, and how he actually benefited them and you learned their language. So there are interactions between Islam and the Viking civilization. By the way, the Viking culture was a different religion, different ethnicity, different looks than the rest of the Europeans, and they embraced Christianity much later than other uh, segments of Europe. Nonetheless, now let's get to our modern Scandinavian countries. You should all be aware that Scandinavian countries have a very different system of government, of, of, of laws, of politics. They are a type of social democracy, which means some of the highest taxation rates in the world, all of them, and also some of the best perks of all of the world. Norway is regularly voted to be the best country on earth in terms of standard of living. Right? You pay very high taxes, 70%, 60%. The income disparity is very little. Everybody gets a similar wage, middle, upper middle class. Everybody gets a very similar wage. But then the perks over there are massive. Healthcare, absolutely free and very easy. Uh, the education system, there's no concept of paying. There's no concept. They're shocked that why would the government not give free education to the PhD, to the anything. What do you do? Medicine, engineering, whatever you want to do. All of it is taken care of by the uh, government. Also, one of the things that you should be aware of is that Scandinavian countries in general, unlike America and England, they are very monocultural. So the bulk of the people, one ethnicity, one culture, and they have a lot of history. This is all gonna impact our study of Islam because when you have one massive monolith population, then outsiders really are outsiders, right? That's one of the big differences that we have in America. America is a land of immigrants. The only indigenous people are being forced to live in reservation camps in this country. Otherwise, everybody's an immigrant. And this is one of the biggest perks and positives of this country, that nobody can claim that we have been here for 2,000, 4,000 years. Whereas in Scandinavia, that they can claim that, and the Muslims are very recent uh, immigrants. Also realize, these are very small countries. The population of Greater Dallas is actually more than the population of Denmark as a country, and Norway as a country. Our Greater Dallas, who knows how many people live in the greater, meaning the whole conglomerate of Dallas, all of Dallas. How many people are we? Seven to eight million, correct, yes. All of greater Dallas, seven to eight million. All of Norway, five million. All of Denmark, five million. Sweden's a little bit more, 10 million. So you can imagine now the quantities are much smaller in a one entire country. This changes everything because when you have a small group of people all speak the same language, all look the same, ethnically they're the same, then you have outsiders. What's gonna happen? What's happening in these countries is going to happen as we see. Now, within the last 30 years, Islam has gone from zero to the second largest religion in all of these three countries. This is a very important historical fact. In the 60s, Islam was almost non-existent in all three of these countries. In the 60s and 70s, hardly any Muslims. We're talking about less than 0.1%. Within the last 30 years, Islam has gone from almost zero to, believe it or not, 10% in every major city and capital. Stockholm, 10%. Oslo, 10%. Malmö, another small city, the second largest city in, in Sweden, maybe 13, 14%. It's phenomenal. Now, what's gonna happen though, when so quickly you have a bunch of people coming, look different, speak different, act different. That's why these countries are very different than so many other European uh, countries. Now, why has there been mass migration? Where do these Muslims come from? Two main sources in all three of these countries. The first batch in the 70s and 80s, these countries really needed cheap manual labor. They needed workers. It's not like m many other countries where you have you know, people migrating illegal, however it might be. Those countries, you have to get the visa to get there. So they decided to actively bring groups of people to do the lowest jobs in the factories, manual labor. And they chose some countries, primarily amongst them was Pakistan. 
They actually chose Pakistani peasants and laborers. Not, we're not talking engineers and computer scientists. No, they needed factory workers. And so they went to certain areas in the Punjab, in the villages, and like, we want to give. So it became, and also some other pockets, Bosnia, some places in Turkey. But all of these were manual laborers, right? And again, this is an awkward topic, but when you bring people that are not college educated, it is what it is. They're going to live differently, act differently. This is just the reality. It's an awkward topic, but it needs to be said here, right? So the first batch was all people who were coming to work in the factories. Initially, they weren't allowed to bring families. Then the grumbling and this and that, they didn't want them to marry locals, so they allowed them to bring, to bring families, right? So this is the first batch in the 70s. Then in the 80s and then 90s, these three countries decided they needed more people to come. Why? Because their birth rate is amongst the lowest in the world. Their birth rate is amongst the lowest in the world. They need people to come. So they decided that they're going to actively allow refugees from war-torn countries to come. And where were the war-torn countries in the 90s? Which countries in the 90s? Somalia and Afghanistan and Iran as well, that re the political refugees came, right? In the 2000s, Iraqis. So one of the largest batch of immigrant Iraqis is in the Scandinavian, these Nordic countries, right? And again, these are all Muslim lands because they, these are the refugees fleeing and these countries want fresh blood. They want tiny people to come. And so they brought in tens of thousands of people from these lands, the majority of whom happened to be Muslim. Realize, they didn't actively pursue, you know, we want Muslim. They wanted people. They want people to come and they want their country to thrive. And who's going to come because it's really cold, guys. I was there now and it was freezing cold right the sun doesn't set in some of these places you have to realize it's a you know the um sorry the the sun doesn't rise excuse me in the winter times in the northern cities it's like you know perpetual dark and perpetual night uh, they were telling me that um in ramadan uh, in some years there's 22 23 hours of fasting like in some cities they were saying that the iftar and the suhoor is organized for the same batch of people they come, they break fast, they pray taraweeh, they eat suhoor, they pray fajr, they go home. Literally, one batch, come in, come out, that's it. Because that's how it goes over there. So in some ways, these countries are very difficult to live in, right? But in other ways, obviously, there are many perks over there. So what has happened? And again, I have to be uh, a bit generic here because there are three separate countries. Each one has slightly different issues. So I'm being a little bit bird's eye. So please, if somebody wants to come and I have many critics, Allah Mustan, they want to nitpick. I'm trying to be, teach you some broad ideas. I'm not being 100% accurate to all three of them. But generically, what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, what we see, there is a massive divide between the indigenous population and between those that are coming from Muslim backgrounds. And the majority of immigrants are from Muslim backgrounds in all three of these. Because again, of the reasons that I said. And so, because this is a homogenous culture, one culture, one ethnicity, one group, one history, and they all look the same, talk the same, act the same. Anybody who doesn't look like them, and they're all, mashallah, seven foot tall, blonde hair, blue eye. I'm just kidding, they're, they're not seven foot, but they're six foot seven. Every one of them, they're mashallah, this tall, whatnot. They're all different. And then you have all of us coming along. We stick out like sore thumbs, right? We are totally different from them. So what has happened, this quick, you know, um, influx of refugees and of immigrants has changed the dynamics. And by changing the dynamics, what has happened? Far-right parties, far-right parties have become extremely popular. Nobody could have predicted because these three countries, all of them were left-leaning in the 70s and 80s. There's an interesting point here. These three countries were the most liberal, the most left-leaning 30, 40 years ago. Now, all three of them, they have some of the most far-right parties becoming mainstream. Some of the most blatant Islamophobia. And that's why there's a reputation, like especially Denmark. You, you all know Denmark, how many things happen in Denmark. There is this reputation, I'm not saying it's correct, but there's a perception that Islamophobia is the worst in these countries, maybe only after France. And perhaps there's an element of truth, but there's also obviously a bit of an exaggeration. Another thing we need to understand is that these countries, their role of the government is not like America. The people expect their government to be involved at every level. We call it a nanny state. 
the nanny, they take care of you, right? Which means the government is expected to monitor what you say. It is expected to physically enact laws that protect their culture. Unlike America, we have the First Amendment. Unlike America where we're expected to be individualistic, those governments are expected to protect overall the, the uh, cohesiveness of society. They're expected to get involved in everything and every facet of society. I'm going to tell you something, it's going to blow your mind up. The government actually takes charge of all religious institutions. Any religion can come and open their temple, their mosque, their synagogue, and write down who comes, and the government will pay depending on the number of musallin, the number of synagogue, temple, worship. The government will f fund your center of worship. Anybody in Norway, you can declare, I'm a member of this church. And when you declare, the church will get, I don't know how much, maybe $200 a month or something. Do the math. If you have a thousand people coming, right? The government will pay the masjid monthly, 30, 40, 50,000. Where's the Epic board members? This is why, this is why there's no fundraising over there. There's no fundraising, but every person has to declare only one masjid. They cannot go three, four, five masjids, right? one temple, one church, and you register. So the musallin are registered and every masjid is eager that you come to our masjid because by coming, can you imagine if Epic started doing that? <laughs> Collecting your information and you have to register and then the government is gonna give us funding. This is how it works over in Norway, at least. In other countries, there's other funding, but in Norway in particular, you are literally, to this day, the masjids of Norway are funded by the Norwegian government, not just the masjids, any temple. Now, you will say, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, but what happens when others fund? Control. Control. Because, you know the golden rule? Azharbai, you know the golden rule? He who has the gold gets to make the rules. That's the capitalist golden rule. He who has the gold gets to make the rules. When Norway is going to give money to the masjid, Norway now has the right to dictate. And previously, they didn't care about dictating any, to any, any, any church, temple, but things have changed. And so all of a sudden, what is happening now? If you want money from us, you cannot preach anything against our values. Now, what is against our values? Morality, sexuality, um, even hijab and segregation. Because this is against the values. These countries have banned the burqa, they've banned the niqab, right? It's fine to wear the niqab over this, not allowed. So it's a huge crisis now because the culture, firstly, the Muslims themselves, generally speaking, compared to us, socioeconomically, they're not like us. Understand why? Where did they come from, right? Socioeconomically, they're not like us. They're working different types of jobs. Secondly, well, the taxation is so high. Thirdly, they're not accustomed to the culture of giving. They're accustomed to the culture of receiving. So fundraisers like we do are almost unheard of. They're not used to it. So now the government has pretty much control. And this is now one of the biggest crises that they were facing. They were trying to get my advice. Like, I have no, I've never expected this type of problem. We thank Allah, no matter how difficult our fundraisers are, we thank Allah that because of that, we have independence. Nobody can tell us what to say, right? Let me tell you one, a very sad thing that is happening right now. So in Sweden, I told you this, this nanny state, in Sweden, what you can do any community can come together and say, we have 30, 40, 50 kids, we're gonna have a school. The government will build the school, pay for it, pay the teachers, every community can build its own school. I mean, obviously you have conditions, but basically you come together, you have the conditions, and the government will finance your school for you. So throughout the 90s, 2000s, Muslims came together, the government funded, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 schools. The government funded it. Sadly, every one of them has been shut down in the last year. Every one of them.
There is no Islamic school in Sweden, or Mus forget Islam, Muslim school anymore. Why? Secret terror laws, you guys are, we can't tell you the details they told us, they told them. We cannot tell you the details, but whatever it might, you know what it is, it's Islamophobia, guilt by association, or we are teaching values, whatever. So now, and, and you know, we read in the news, and I read in the news, how can the government shut down Islamic schools? When I went there, I found out, well, they can shut them down because they're the ones funding them. They're the money's coming from them. Because I was wondering, even when I read it, I couldn't understand how, what right does the government have to shut down schools? Well, obviously, if it's their money, it's their right. What are you going to say about that, right? And now the Muslims don't have a single Muslim school in all of Sweden. And the problem comes, they're not accustomed to the culture of fundraising. They're not accustomed. As it is, low income, high taxes. On top of that, to build your own school, it is phenomenal expense in those lands. So they're going through all of these crises, what to do, this and that. So this is one of the things we need to understand about these countries is that, yes, there are a lot of perks to live there. But at the same time, because of that, there's also, uh, there's also a bit of a, a control over there. Now, uh, another uh, point I want to mention here is that in the last 20, 30 years, as I said, these countries have gone generally from being far left to actually becoming more sympathetic to the right. And the, perhaps the most blatant example of this is Denmark. In its, in its wanting to, uh, its pr provocative cartoons, for example, right? And banning uh, the slaughter of animals. They banned Dabah. And when they banned it, Norway and others so followed suit. You cannot purchase halal meat in any of these countries. Where do they get it from? They have to import from other countries. It's unbelievable. You cannot slaughter. They say it's inhumane. You must beat or kill or stun the animal, right? You cannot slaughter the way we slaughter. And again, all of this is happening for the last 10 years. All of this is new that's happening here. So they have to import their halal meat, which is why it's super expensive to have halal meat over there. But khair, so this is some of the, the um, negatives over there. Of course, perhaps the greatest um, negative incident that happened was the uh, massacre of, uh, by Anders Breivik, one of the far right in Norway, right? In Norway, to, so again, this is, you, you all remember when that madman uh, bombed in Oslo, and then he went to some island off of Norway, and he killed almost 70 teenagers, right? Anders Breivik, this is around 10 years ago, in 2011. This is a very key symptom of the rise of the far right. This person, very sane, very rational, very lucid, he wrote a manifesto, 100-page manifesto. You can read it. It's been translated. You can read it. And in it, he said that our ancestors, the Vikings, fought against these people. We had our own culture. We had our own heritage. Now, the left-wing government is committing cultural and ethnic genocide. He used the term genocide. Our identity is being gone. Look around you, he said. You see these brown skin, whatever. He didn't say browns. Maybe he did. I don't know. With the Muslims. You see them everywhere. Where is our culture gone? And whose fault is it? The left-wing party. So he attacked, not the Muslims. He didn't attack the mosque like the guy in New Zealand did. The guy in New Zealand attacked the masjid. This guy, by the way, the guy in New Zealand was inspired by this guy. The guy in New Zealand read the manifesto of Anders Breivik. It's a very academic manifesto. He, he wanted to write this book. The goal of the terrorist attack was so people read his, this writing. It went viral in the far-right community. And it's a very dangerous manifesto. So he wrote that the, the left-wing party is destroying our heritage. And so I'm going to make a point by shooting at them. So he bombed in Oslo some outside the parliament. And then he took a boat. There was a youth conference. So suppose, suppose the Democratic Party, right? Suppose the Demo De 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 Democratic Party was having a teenager's conference somewhere. That's the equivalent of what he attacked. He wanted to give the shock and awe message of killing children. These are teenagers, not even adults. There was no armed police over there. There was nothing. That's why for an hour and a half, he was armed to the teeth. He went through the whole woods just killing children. These are 15, 14, 17 years old. So tragic. Majority of them were 
obviously, not even Muslim, maybe one or two are Muslim, but the majority of them were just, you know, people of society. They were the part of that democratic party, the socialist party. And his goal was to send the message that this party is betraying who we are. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works in ways beyond. Uh, this incident was actually one of the biggest causes of the backlash against the far right. This incident, believe it or not, calmed many people down that actually this rhetoric is going too far. And it actually helped some common sense and bringing about a sense of, you know, unity. And because Muslims didn't do it, if you remember when it began, everybody saying Muslims, Muslims, turned out to be a far right, you know, local person that did it, right? So uh, this incident actually caused Norway to be slightly different than Denmark. And it helped curb Islamophobia in Norway to a certain extent. But Denmark and then Sweden have gone the exact opposite way. Sweden was one of the most welcoming of refugees because they genuinely had those notions of the 70s. We're one world, we're one together, we want to have everybody different. Then when all of these last 20, 30 years have happened, now it looks like Sweden is beginning to regret what did we do now. And so they're curbing and they're forcing. You have to become like our culture. They're kind of putting all of these laws in place. But the good news is that, alhamdulillah, the Muslim community is now maturing up. As you can understand, and I don't want to be critical of other Muslim communities that I go, that I go to, but generically speaking, one of the problems of Western Islam, Western Muslims, one of the biggest problems, and especially in these countries, is the division that exists amongst the Muslims themselves. You have to understand, this is first generation immigrants. Can you imagine the people who migrated from villages in Punjab and from villages in Ethiopia, those people are now here in one country. What do they have in common? Nothing. They have nothing in common. So ethnically, the divisions there are much more pronounced than in America. You have the Pakistani masjid, you have the Ethiopian masjid, you have the Turkish masjid, you have the Bosnian masjid. So ethnically big divisions. And they can't even communicate in their mother languages. And many of them are struggling, even they're learning the, the language of the people. Very complicated language as you know, but alhamdulillah they're now learning it. Iraqis, they've just come 10 years ago. Afghans have come right now. They're not, what, what language are they going to speak with anybody? So actually... We say Oslo is 10% Muslim. Stockholm is 10% Muslim. Yes, it is. 10% of the city is Muslim. But they're not united. Ethnically, massive divisions. And then, one of the worst problems of the whole world within our ummah, sectarian divisions. And you know, I have been a very vocal critic. The same sectarian differences back home have now been imported. And you have, believe it or not, while there's so much Islamophobia, the Barelvi Masjid there, the Deobandi Masjid there, the Tablighi Masjid there, the Ahl Hadith Masjid there, can you believe? And this is the reality, right? And you, you laugh at this, but I'm telling you, what do you expect is going to happen now, right? And, but this is the elder generation. When I went, Alhamdulillah, massive crowds coming, the new generation is coming, diverse people are coming, and inshaAllah ta'ala, the new born and raised this is now going to end on a positive note. Those that have been born and raised in those lands, their vision is changing. And they have a sense of identity. Alhamdulillah, when I went to Norway in Oslo, they're building the largest community center modeled after Epic. They literally said, we're modeling it after Epic. And they want to have, by the way, every city I went to, they were so happy at Epic's vision, Epic's masjid, Epic 2.0, every city. They're, alhamdulillah, we are, alhamdulillah, I was told to give salams to all of you and to our shiuch and everything. So alhamdulillah, they're monitoring us. But in Norway, seven, eight, nine million dollar project funded by themselves and the Muslim communities around the world. Not funded by the government. They're not going to take money from the government. They're seeing now what's happening. And I visited, I, I taught the class that I did, the Sira class I did, I taught it in their center. MashaAllah, four or five hundred people packed to the audience. They're building a massive structure for them, a massive structure from ground up. No, no government control, independent. So Alhamdulillah, now we are seeing a resurgence. The youth are coming to Islam. The Islamic identity is very strong amongst the youth. And they recognize that they have a role to play here. And of course, they're born and raised there. They speak the language fluently. So Alhamdulillah, my humble assessment is that 
their struggles are very different than ours and in some ways they have it more difficult but in some ways they have it easier because these cities are much smaller than Dallas and, and whatnot. Stockholm is less than a million, right? And in Stockholm, if you have 10% Muslim, I was in the city of Malma, Malma, it's, it's, it's spelled with an O, but it's pronounced Malma. And they said that if the Swedish population maintains its negative and the Muslim population maintains, Muslims have, mashallah, the average of what, five, six, seven kids, right? Uh, the average, mashallah, that's her secret weapon, I say. That the prediction is, this is the halal secret weapon, guys, huh? So don't really take the video and miss it. Halal secret weapon. It's not our fault we have more kids, guys. You want to do whatever you want to do. It's all halal, alhamdulillah. So if the projection continues, I was told by one of the local counselors there that within one generation, it is very likely that this city will almost be half Muslim. Because this city is just not there. The locals are not reproducing. It's not our fault. I mean, it's not, it's, I don't know why they're getting irritated at us. We're, it's not our fault we're having kids, right? So it's not even, so the point is what's going to happen to the majority? Now, finish off on this negative note. You know, the Swedish Quran burning. You're hearing this happening, right? I passed by the place where the guy did it. And he did it in a district of Malma that is 90% Muslim. Everywhere you see hijabis and thobes and beer, the whole city, you're like, where am I? Every falafel shop, you know, is over there. Every shawarma, you know, everything is over there. And you're like, am I in Sweden or I'm in Baghdad or, or, or Damascus? Where am I? The entire, you know, subdivision is Muslim. So what's going to happen? This far right guy is going to say, what's going on here? Right? And so he literally stood smack in the middle. They showed me, I saw the video footage a few weeks or months ago. They showed me that exact location. It's literally in front of all the you know, apartment complexes of the Muslim community there. He, and he wants to provoke. What's going to happen? And again, it's awkward to say this, but what do you think is going to happen? These are, these are teenagers that are coming from war zones. These are actual Afghans that have seen blood actual Iraqis that have seen the invasions. What do you think they're going to do when this person comes and burns the Quran in front of them? So obviously, they, the police had to be called. You understand, I mean, but he wants this. And he's willing to die like Anders Breivik is lifelong. He's willing to die because he thinks this is how I'm going to send the message to the people that they need to wake up here. So, there's a lot of tension in those lands, but at the same time, the Muslim, and, and this needs to be said as well, awkward reality. So we do have groups of Muslims that are saying and doing things that are very problematic. I don't blame them because they're not, they, they have just come from overseas and they're just, you know, learning the language and they don't understand long-term vision. So they're acting and saying and doing things and they're attracted to interpretations of Islam that are, Again, it's, you know, it's going to be a, a reaction. If you're not going to want me, khalas, then I'm going to go down a very radical route. So unfortunately, when the um, jihadi groups were active 10 years ago, Scandinavian countries did have quite a lot of young men go there. Because when society calls you terrorists all the time, I'm not excusing them for what they did, but these youngsters are attracted to those ideologies too. So radical interpretations of Islam, hardline interpretations of Islam are actually common amongst the youth there. Because when society is going to treat you like this, you're going to absorb those values. If you're not welcome, you're going to say, khalas, I don't want you guys, I'm going to go there. And mature people on both sides need to understand this is not the way forward. Mature people need to understand this is not the way forward. On a positive note, and this we conclude, because Scandinavian countries don't have foreign lobbies like our country does, the one positive thing, generally speaking, they're far more pro-Palestinian. They're much more open to the reality because they don't have concentration of the other group over there. They don't have that. And they don't have foreign lobbies. And they can see the reality for what it is. So to give you an example, Sweden, 20 years ago, was one of the first European countries to have a permanent ambassadorial position for Palestine. They literally said, we don't care, there's a Palestinian state. And they had an, and in Jerusalem, they had their ambassador for Palestine. And in Sweden, they had a Palestinian representative. 
What other country did that, right? Sweden had that. Norway, as you should be following the news, one of the most vocal critics of Israeli tactics right now, right? So you see they're not influenced by these other groups. So to be honest and fair, this is not pure Islamophobia because they're fighting for the truth. What it is, they see or some people see their culture, their lands being changed. And so they want to react in this vicious manner. The solution, the goal is the Muslim communities need to be at the forefront and they need to embody the reality of our faith by being productive members, by integrating the way we're supposed to while maintaining our religious and our ethical values. And inshallah ta'ala, my tour this time gave me a lot of good hope and good you know, vision. The community is thriving in spite of all the opposition. There are good people in the government. There are wise leadership amongst the Muslims. And I feel inshallah ta'ala that in these lands, because they're smaller lands and concentration is so high, we're going to see a very interesting development of Muslims in these Scandinavian regions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them and all of us. And until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. يا ايها الذين امنوا انفقوا مما رزقناكم من قبل من قبل ان ياتي يوم لا بيع فيه ولا خله ولا شفاعه والكافرون هم الظالمون 